Uh, well, thanks for us and uh, thanks for uh, having me all from Learn the Birds. Um, hopefully we get to connect sometime soon. Um, <clears throat> so I apologize to anybody who was uh, very excited to uh, hear the things that I was gonna say and see the things I was gonna share. Um, last time, it turns out I was on a scouting trip to Washington and I thought I was gonna have service and then I didn't. And you know how that situation goes, um, but I am profusely sorry, but it turns out I may try my best to make up for it this evening. But um, with that being said, my name is Benny Jacob Schwartz. I'm from Los Angeles, California. I am a birder, photographer, guide, educator, human being. Um, and uh, I do my bird guiding side hustle and photography fun stuff. And I'm also uh, a program director for a nonprofit here in uh, Los Angeles, California called BioCitizen Los Angeles. Um, and we get kids off the screen and into the green doing a uh, local place-based adventures, talking about ecology, um, natural history, conservation, uh, racial justice, social justice, incorporating indigenous perspectives and topics like land back and how we as human beings and living in a post-colonial era can continue to steward these spaces um, amidst the Anthropocene, this uh, massive extinction thing that we are all experiencing throughout the globe. And, some communities are disproportionately portionally affected by climate change. And um, in general, I'm a holistic kind of practitioner of education. And so this presentation titled The Marvelous Hummingbird um, is going to go from a more general scope to um, more specifics. And so we'll have a little bit of history about hummingbirds, chronology and things like that and evolutionary stuff. And then we're gonna get into some case studies and explorations um, from sea to summit. And once again, thank you for us for having me. It's a true pleasure. Um, and again, my name is Benny Jacob Schwartz, AKA Birds by Beegis, Benjamin Isaac Jacobs Schwartz. And um, how do I communicate with folks? Well, I started Birds by Beegis in an effort to kind of break the mold of what traditional birding looked like and who was doing it. And as you can see, or at least in the past, it was predominantly one demographic, uh, but I'm trying to kind of bridge that gap between my generation of folks who spent a lot of time on their screens and social media um, with compelling imagery to uh, catalyze conversations around nature and the outdoors. Um, and this is uh, one aspect of my business. I do kind of bird and ecology walks. So this is a crew of birders out in Lake Merritt in Oakland, California, which is an excellent urban place to go birding. And then um, one of the other things I was doing before the pandemic was some corporate team building. So um, providing opportunities for organizations to allow their staff some mindfulness um, opportunities locally um, with kind of the foci of the experience surrounded by nature connection, sustainability, and birding, um, many of which kind of tie back to this mindfulness idea and using bird song and things like that to tune into space. And now we're here together talking about hummingbirds. Well, <clears throat> what makes a hummingbird a hummingbird? It's a good question, honestly. Um, and before I get into it, um, most of the photography in here is mine unless otherwise uh, noted. So enjoy. Um, what makes a hummingbird a hummingbird? Well, is it their evolutionary history? Is it their distribution? Is it their role as pollinators? What about their special flying abilities? Or maybe just their size, is it? since they're so small? Well, we're gonna answer those questions and a lot more this evening. So our presentation will be about 50 minutes. Um, I'm gonna put my timer on right now so I don't tell too many stories. Um, but as you can see, there are roughly 360 different species of hummingbirds found throughout the world. Now, that's a lot. <laughs> we're not gonna cover them all today, um, but we are gonna cover some of them, of course. And, uh, many of which are actually photographed in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, we have white neck Jacobin, ruby topaz, copper rumped hummingbird, um, female ruby topaz, black and mango, um, and a couple Ecuadorian gems. We have velvet purple coronet, um, I think magenta throated wood star, or excuse me, uh, mag magenta throated sun angel, I forget, it's been a minute. Um, and then Gould jewel front, a very cool bird. Um, <clears throat> Already, so hummingbirds, they are only found in the new world. Well, that is a relative term based on the idea that when um, 
people from Europe came to the United States or the Western Hemisphere, no one was living here. So they found this new world. Um, for all intents and purposes, we're going to continue to refer to that, but let it be known that this is not a new world. Um, indigenous people have been occupying these lands for literally time memoriam, which is at least 10,000 years. Um, and even in California, where I live, the nearby mountain ranges have been occupied for 10,000 years. However, we're getting back to the birds. So if we look at these locations, um, Canada holds five species of hummingbirds. The United States holds 27 species. Mexico is home to 59 species. If you're starting to see a trend, you're paying attention. As we get closer to this tropical area, we can see that the species uh, diversity and richness is going up dramatically. Well, we just made our way through North America. Let's dive right in to Central America. All right, hummingbirds by country in Central America. So we've got some numbers flying at you. Um, again, you can see more trends happening. It's hard to drive a, a direct trend because countries like Belize compared to Honduras, obviously Belize is much smaller, but as you can still see, um, these countries hold quite a high diversity of hummingbird species, topping out um, Central America's high list in Panama with uh, approximately 59 species. So there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, we're not gonna get crazy into that, but we will continue driving into South America, which is kind of the hot spot in the world for hummingbirds. So Colombia holds it down with 165. Now you might be in a country where your entire country list is 165. Um, and that just goes to show how, how fantastically unique and special the tropical regions are. Um, Ecuador holds its own with 133, Peru 125, Venezuela 99. I'm not gonna announce them all because I assume folks can read. Um, if you can't text me um, and we'll figure some things out. Uh, French Guiana, Paraguay, Chile. So as you can see, as we're getting towards the southern half of South America, those numbers are actually dropping off much more similar uh, as to what we observed with Canada, the United States, and Mexico. So those tropical regions basically sandwiched between the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cancer is what we define as the New World Tropics. Um, and we're not going to talk about that too much today. That is another pre presentation. But the next thing we're talking about hummingbirds is where the heck did they come from, right? They didn't just buzz out of nowhere. Um, and if we look at this cladogram here, or this evolutionary tree, um, we can see actually that it traces back to this uh, group or super group or whatever called apodiforms. Um, and then it branches out here to apodi. Um, and we have tree swifts and standard swifts. And then um, as we go back, back before it's split, it goes to trochilidae, which are the hummingbird family. So you can see here, um, they're very closely related. Now, don't believe me, um, I wouldn't either because pretty much you can make anything on the computer these days. Um, so here's a source that actually indicates this uh, scientific fact from this author whose name I'm not gonna pronounce. So it was around 52 million years ago, we found a fossil in Europe, which was basically conclusive evidence of the commonality and uh, evolutionary similarities between the swifts and the hummingbirds. And so um, some of these main points included uh, the number of bones in the wing, uh, the length of the tarsus, which is a bone in the, in the foot, um, and the really short legs. Um, so there's a couple other things, but beyond the scope of what I'm really interested in talking about, but more or less, if you wanna hear more about this, uh, you can check out this paper from Kesepka et al. All right. Long story short, they are a relic of our modern apodiforms. Now, another thing that's pretty interesting about hummingbirds is something we call sexual dimorphism. And for folks who are birders, this is probably a pretty standard term. Uh, but for folks who might be just joining the community, um, we can break this down pretty easily, right? Dime means two, morph means shape. Um, so that between the genders, or between the sexes, there are two shapes present. So here's a prime example. Um, up top, we have a booted racket tail. This is the Andean subspecies. You can see it's got the orange leg tufts. Um, and then here's the female. Um, another classic example, again, photographed in TNT, is uh, a male ruby topaz and a female ruby topaz. So um, quite different in uh, their appearance, although the size is pretty much the same. Another interesting thing about hummingbirds are they are specialized nectarivores. Um, what that means is they are things that eat nectar. So although this is not a uh, native species to California, this is the Cape Honeysuckle from, from South Africa. It is widely spread um, throughout my range here in California. 
Um, and this is an Allen's hummingbird hitting it for its nectar at the base. So as you can see, they are specialized to uh, obtain nectar from uh, these tubular flowers. Tubular, man. All right. Another interesting fact is they are co-evolved with ornithopholius flowers. What the heck does that mean? Well, orna meaning birds and folius meaning, uh, think loving. So bird loving flowers. So they've basically co-evolved over thousands of years, both the birds and the flowers to have this um, amazing, some would say symbiotic relationship. Um, and this is of course the sword-billed hummingbird from the highlands of Ecuador. Um, and here's a great example of the flower that they most commonly pollinate. And so as you can see, um, this is the corolla, right? This kind of fleshy, papery part of the flower, the anthers, which hold the pollen, um, the style and the stigma, which is where the pollen uh, goes down the pollen tube and it fertilizes the eggs, creating the ovule, which eventually this whole part falls off and then the inflated fruit forms um, and then is eaten by somebody and then pooped out by somebody and then the seed is dispersed. Now, these birds play an important role in pollination, right? So to get to the nectar that's hiding at the base of the flower, they have to stick their whole face basically up in here, which gets dabbed with pollen. We'll talk about that a little bit more, but it is fantastically um, special, this, this relationship between the sword bills um, and this dramatically long uh, flower. So that's just one example of coevolution. Um, and so in the tropical regions, there are roughly 7,000 plant species that are in fact pollinated by hummingbirds. Um, if we compare that to North America, the number drops down dramatically to 125 species. So why is that? Well, if we remember looking at the maps of the Western Hemisphere, we can see that species richness and species diversity of hummingbirds is the highest in our tropical regions and peaking in places like Colombia and Ecuador. Um, so it makes sense, right? Those regions have higher species richness and higher species biodiversity than any other place in the world for the most part. So um, it only makes sense that there are a wide variety of plant species and a wide variety of hummingbird species that have obviously co-evolved. All right, now we're gonna dive a little bit into the topic of biology and adaptations. Now, if our bodies ran the same way as hummingbirds, we'd have to eat roughly 1,300 sandwiches a day. 1,300 sandwiches a day. Let that sink in. Well, obviously hummingbirds don't eat sandwiches, but they do eat a lot of things aside from just nectar, which they do consume a lot of. This is a tufted coquette on a vervain hedge in Trinidad and Tobago, courtesy of Faraz Abdul's professional guiding services. So once things open up, you know who to, who to call for your professional birding needs in TNT and beyond. Um, so some ways that they're able to uh, maintain their metabolism oopsies, and get the calories they need is through territory defending. So this is um, bladder paw. This is a California native plant species where I live. Um, and these actually bloom all year round. So for folks that live in California, um, bladder pot is a great one because they're blooming year round and the hummingbirds love to hang out here um, and defend their bladder pod bush, which gives you a great opportunity for photography as well as direct natural history observation. Another way hummingbirds uh, drink nectar or get to their nectar is through trap lining. So just like a kid on a bicycle kind of has his paper route, um, hummingbirds like this uniquely adapted white tip sicklebill uh, with photography courtesy of my buddy Sean, um, who's a fantastic conservationist, biologist, and uh, photographer, of course. Um, these birds visit uh, a wide variety of plants, but predominantly are feeding on those found in the Heliconia family um, and the genus Heliconia, I believe. Here's another example from TNT. This is, I believe, a green hermit um, hitting a Heliconia. So trap lining, instead of spending all of their time on one flower, or on one bush, they basically make their flower route through the forest. And as they depart the flower they just tapped, they allow it to refill its nectar supply and they go from A to B to C to D to E to F to G to H and so on and so forth until they've completed their paper route and then they restart again. So a lot of folks are under the misconception that hummingbirds just drink nectar. Well, I'm here to shatter that reality. So take a look at this video from tracyportraits.com. 
of a hummingbird eating an invertebrate. Now, if you missed that, let's watch this again. Insect entering the screen right here, hummingbird teeing up, boom. So in addition to um, just those little flies that we just observed, um, hummingbirds consume mosquitoes, ants, gnats, and aphids. And in case you didn't know what they are, they're all here. Um, and sometimes they actually get caught in spider webs when they're attempting to hawk or tweeze insects out of their net, uh, out of their webs. And in this case, this orb weaver um, is probably going to be well fed for quite some time. All right. Um, another ingenious strategy that hummingbirds employ when they are um, trying to get their calories is through sap well visiting. Um, a sap well, in this case, is excavated by this species of, humming, of woodpeckers called a red-breasted sap sucker, um, and it creates these uh, very even symmetrical holes, um, which basically taps into the sap in the tree, and the sap flows freely through these little holes, and when the sap sucker is not looking, the hummingbird swoops in and laps up the sugary substance, and we'll have a little bit more opportunity to explore that later. Now, continuing on our adaptations biology, we're gonna talk about flight. Now, flight with hummingbirds is very interesting because they are the only animal in the world that can fly essentially in 360 degrees. They can go up, down, sideways, and they can even fly backwards. Now, see if you can see what adaptation is allowing them to achieve this. So you can see it's slowing down a bit in slow motion and then back to real motion. Uh, this is an adult male Anna's hummingbird uh, foraging for nectar on a banksia at the UC Santa Cruz Arboretum. If you're from Africa, I or Australia, excuse me, uh, you may have seen some banksia species. Now it's pretty hard to see, but in this video, the reason that hummingbirds are able to fly in all directions is because they are able to hover. Now their hovering is achieved because both the upstroke and the downstroke from the bird creates lift. So if you can imagine that when they go down, it's actually creating lift as well as it goes up. And so instead of just like flap, 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 like you see maybe kites doing this, kestrels doing this, red-tailed hawks will sometimes do this, uh, pied kingfishers I've seen doing this type of behavior, they'll actually like uh, kite or hover in place. And so the hummingbird is so unique in this sense that it's superior, of, it's a superior flyer to the other aforementioned species in the sense that they're creating almost what's like looks like an infinity sign with their wings it keeps going like this and it happens so fast that you don't even notice it it just looks like zzz. so they are fantastic flyers and that's the reason why now continuing down the adaptation and morphology train we are going to look at hummingbird tongues so take a look at this little clip of a white neck jacobin's tongue um, from again Trinidad and Tobago and you can see how long their tongue is which is pretty awesome right this allows them if they can't get all the way into the back of the flower they can get pretty darn close now there's something more happening than just having a long tongue for hummingbirds to succeed in their uh, nectar consumption so take a look at this video from PBS and KCET and uh, tell me what you think with high speed macro photography we see something truly new. Hummingbirds' long tongues have open tips that open as the tongue dips into the nectar. Honey curls along the edges of the open tips, creating movement. Spring open. Structure science has never seen before, and it's an incredibly efficient technology for picking up a liquid. It was Alejandro's resourcefulness and the painstaking work he did. So more than meets the eye, and sometimes we need some crazy fancy high speed photography to capture the subtle details, but pretty fantastic. Whoopsies, that's not what I wanted. 
All righty. All right, Alejandro, we got it. All right, adaptations for sight. So it turns out I'm going to be able to see. And how do they do that? Well, Vision, first and foremost, plays an essential role in hummingbird feeding and hovering behavior. And the key player here is high retinal neuron density. So retinal neurons are essentially cells that are found within the eye. And they serve to transform basically what the bird is seeing with its eyes, this optical image. And they basically extract this biologically relevant information, including light intensity changes, changes in chromacity, and time. And so this allows the hummingbirds to basically be evaluating their surroundings, excuse me, in like faster than real time. And so the takeaway here is just to understand that retinal neurons, this high density that's found in their eyes, help the hummingbirds navigate these really tight spaces, low lighting, um, tons of obstacles. I mean, have you ever seen a hummingbird in like the understory? or even just zipping around in your neighborhood or whatever, they are amazing flyers. And the retinal neurons play a huge part in their ability to navigate. All right, now we're gonna dive into some energy requirements and metabolism. So while in flight, hummingbirds have the fastest metabolism of any animal other than insects. Here are some clips of some hummingbirds I've captured. Um, this is from Tondiapa Bird Lodge in Ecuador, shot on my DSLR. The next clip are some white neck Jacobins shot on my GoPro from Tobago. And here are some booted racket tails shot in slow mo from my iPhone and a tripod. So, as you can see, it must take a lot of work to remain in flight for so much of the day. And we talked about that hummingbirds to survive, they'd have to roughly eat. If we were had a high metabolism like hummingbirds, we'd have to eat like 1300 sandwiches a day. Now, how do they support their high metabolism? Well, it turns out their high metabolism is essential to supporting their rapid wing beats. Now let's talk about that for a second. So their possible heart rate is able to reach a maximum of 1,260 beats per minute. Now that is crazy. Combine that with their ability to have 250 breaths per minute. These guys are little machines. And these stats are actually observed in blue-throated hummingbirds. This photo is uh, from Southeast Arizona, um, which is basically the northernmost extent of the blue-throated hummingbird or blue-throated mountain gem. So this exact species is where these stats came from, a study, of course. Now making it a little bit more digestible for folks with an with analogy about their oxygen consumption. So per gram of muscle tissue, the hummingbird oxygen consumption um, is actually 10 times higher than an elite athlete. So like this sparkling violet ear is actually consuming 10 times more oxygen per gram of muscle than even elite athletes like this uh, gentleman, Usain Bolt, who's an Olympian. So a little food for thought, um, but as we keep going, we understand, right, that they extract so much oxygen from their muscle tissue, but how do they, how do they maintain their metabolism? Well, the answer to this question is what we call direct oxidation. So when hummingbirds are consuming sugar um, and other nutrient sources, they're able to actually uh, transform the sugar, which is basically glucose or um, a variety of like different glucoses or fructose or whatever. I pre I'm pretty sure mostly glucose is found naturally in the animal kingdom. Um, but basically they convert it from glucose to um, a more readily available form of sugar called ATP, or if you remember from your high school biology class, adenosine triphosphate is basically gasoline or animals. And so we eat things and our bodies convert them into ATP so that our cells can use them. Now, everything, all animals do that. But what hummingbirds do fantastically is that they're actually converting this sugar into ATP really quickly, like in 30 or 45 minutes. So that's why it's important for hummingbirds to feed so consistently is because if they don't feed often, then they're not gonna, then they're going to burn out and run out of energy because they burn through their food source very quickly. 
Um, now, it doesn't always have to be burned off immediately. It's okay. So I don't want folks to get confused that hummingbirds always burn their food off immediately. It can also be stored as fat. Now, our next case study is the ruby-throated hummingbird. The following images are courtesy of Sean Gracer. And this ruby-throated hummingbird, if you live on the East Coast or basically east of the Rockies, um, I believe this is the only hummingbird species that you really see. Um, as the name alludes to, they do have a ruby throat. And this orange blob is more or less the breeding range of the ruby-throated hummingbirds in the East, more or less. And the concept is around fat being stored on their bodies. Now, this is where they breed. This is where they migrate across, which is 500 miles of open ocean. And for a bird that weighs about three and a half grams, that's quite the distance. But don't get excited yet. This distance was around 500 miles. And there's probably another 500 miles to go after that to where we're heading on the Nicoya Peninsula. Now, on the Nicoya Peninsula, I was fortunate enough to participate on a bird research project in 2013, um, learning about neotropical birds, um, and in particular, monitoring the overwinter, overwinter survival ship of migratory species, um, including the ruby-throated hummingbird. And so we did some ringing from folks from UK, or bird banding for folks uh, in the United States, as we call it. And we banded lots of birds, including some hummingbirds. And in particular, we were interested in the ruby throated hummingbird. And one thing that we found out was that this little lady actually was three years old because this is what we call a recapture. This bird had been banded at our field site three years prior and it had made this journey from the Nicoya Peninsula to wherever it was going in, this, in the Eastern United States six times, one, two, three, four, five, six. So that is crazy mileage for a bird that that's this, that's this small. Um, all birds are handled and photographed under uh, the appropriate permits. And as you can see, um, these birds were not harmed and they just needed a rest for a second after they've been handled in the net. Zip on out of here. Now, whoops, the only reason, I'm sorry about that. The only reason that these hummingbirds are able to achieve that is because instead of burning off um, their food source or burning off their calories immediately into energy, they actually store it as fat. Now, they store it in their furculum, they store it on their vents, and they store it under their wings. And just like you would fill up a car or charge your electric vehicle for your fuel economy, or you would charge up your body with nutrients um, so that your muscles could do the work, hummingbirds do the same thing. Now, they fuel up for their journey, and they deposit this food as fat. And as the bird is flying, um, it basically burns through that fat and turns it into energy. Um, now, we're not completely done talking about migration because we are going to meet another bird who is very interesting. Here we have an orca. Here we have an arctic tern, bald eagle, and snow-capped peaks. And of course, we're talking about Alaska. Hummingbirds in Alaska. I thought hummingbirds were tropical. I did too. However, the Rufus hummingbird is the singular species of hummingbird found in Alaska. This is what we call a long distance migrant. And as you can see, here is a rough map of their range, which is basically here's our breeding habitat, here's our migration areas, and then here is where the birds have been known to winter. Now, it is about 4,000 miles from Mexico to Northwest Canada and Alaska, where we're talking about today. Now, that's pretty dang far. Um, maybe these birds fly directly or maybe they kind of like stop along the way and rest and refuel because 4,000 miles is pretty far for a bird that small. Now, we're not done talking about the Rufus hummingbird um, because we're going to talk about its close relationship with two special flowers. So here we have um, a plant called the Indian paintbrush. Um, the genus for folks is Castileja and um, this is just a general species map, okay? There's a lot of different species of these uh, plants throughout the United States and beyond. And in this case, this is a range map of where you can find uh, one species of Indian paintbrush that ranges all the way up into Alaska. Now look closely, each time I click, we're gonna see an over, we're gonna see another range map of the Rufus hummingbird. Take a look. So again, this is the Rufus hummingbird range map that we're overlaying. Do you see any similarities of what's happening here? 
So essentially what's happening is that the Rufus Hummingbird in addition has, has a very special relationship with the Indian paintbrush and Western Columbine. Now, as the climate warmed over the last 10,000 years, um, following the last little ice age, tropical species like hummingbirds have continued to expand their range as suitable to climate has continued to warm up. Now, if we look back, we can see that the range map is almost identical between the Rufus hummingbird and the Indian paintbrush, which to us indicates that these birds have actually evolved together and that their range expansion has essentially happened at the same time. And the reason for that is these birds require um, nectar sources within their range and these plants need pollinators. So over time, the two of them have expanded their range northward as far north as the Kenai Peninsula um, in Alaska. Now, you may be thinking, this guy is full of nonsense. Well, I might just be, but take a look at this, this video. At just three inches long and weighing little more than a peck, this female Rufus hummingbird has flown over 3,000 miles from Mexico to nests in southeast Alaska. No other hummingbird breeds this far north. Hold you. Males play no part in raising their young. She's raised this chick all on her own. She got an egg the size of a jelly bean. In just three weeks, she's already outgrown the nest. So those were Western Columbines and some fantastic footage courtesy of uh, Channel 5. Um, and here's one more video. So as the hummingbirds are migrating north, it's really hard to know if the weather is going to be suitable, right? Like these guys are just kicking it in the tropics all winter where the temperature is much more consistent, right? Although it may get cooler, hotter, whatever, the range of temperatures in the tropics is more consistent than it is in um, more farther north or southern latitudes. Um, and so sometimes they follow, in general, they kind of follow the migration path of other bird species, including sapsuckers, which we are about to see, courtesy of BBC Earth. A red-breasted sapsucker. Carefully chiseling holes in the tree trunk so the tree sweeps her up the side. Back later to feed once the sap is flowing well. It's a chance the hummingbird has been waiting for. She just needs to get in unnoticed while the sap sucker is busy at another tree. It's all about timing. The sugary sap is starting to overflow. It's now or never. Tongue curls grasping the sap. Licking it in at nine sips a second. She can drink more than her body weight every day. Wow. Over the next three weeks, she'll be back regularly to pilfer this straw. Well, there you go with some fantastic from the BBC Earth. So, in summation about the Rubus hummingbird, it is a long distance migrant throwing down a journey of 4,000 miles from Mexico to Alaska. And when they get to Alaska, <laughs> like I said, sometimes the weather isn't as uh, tropical as its wintering grounds. And sometimes um, it gets there and it is still snowy or it's still cold. Or maybe there's a late summer squall that gets real cold and rainy and chilly and maybe there's a frost. Um, and so hummingbirds in Alaska, hummingbirds in Alaska, um, have some different challenges, some different environmental challenges. 
Um, and their way to adapt to that is dropping their internal temperature from 40 degrees to 18 degrees Celsius or from 105 to 64 Fahrenheit. Now, this is what we call nighttime torpor. So at nighttime, instead of going into like hibernation exactly, because um, hibernation is more classically defined as like a long-term stint um, in which the metabolism drops over multiple months or for the most part, um, nighttime torpor is kind of like this daily um, hibernation cycle in which um, hummingbirds sense at the onset of inclement weather or uh, extremely low temperatures, they'll basically turn down their metabolism till like it's basically just above their base, metab met base metabolic rate. So they just like, just like on your phone, you're like batteries low or whatever, you like close all your apps just to save energy until you can get home to charge up. That's basically what's happening with the hummingbird. So they put their situation all the way to 64 so that they can basically make it through the night. And then when they wake up or they sense that the temperature is changing, um, they wake up and then begin foraging and uh, raise their temperature back up, which is pretty fantastically fascinating. So hummingbirds, like we talked about, have a really critical role in pollination. And it's so critical, um, plants have literally uh, evolved to place their pollen in very specific location on a hummingbird so that one species could hypothetically visit, you know, four different species of flowers that might hypothetically be within its range. And the way that the, the purpose for this is so that the pollen doesn't get mixed up. So you can see here that we have the fuchsias um, that deposit the pollen kind of on the chin or the underside of the bee. Um, but below that, we have pinks like this cardinal catchfly, for example, uh, deposits the pollen right on the bee here. Um, and then if we dive into our third example, the ocotillos, which are a beautiful southwestern plant species here that have fantastic blooms, um, they deposit it kind of on the forecrown or at the base of the bill. And then the last one, the chuparrosas, um, these guys deposit the pollen right on the top of the head, like a little golden cap. Um, all right, so I think that part is really interesting just to think about how uh, animals avoid competing and plants avoid competing. Um, and one way is that hummingbirds go upslope, right? There's plenty of habitat in the Andes, so why don't we head up there? So this next section is about high elevation hummers, and this is the C to summit part. This is the summit part of our presentation. So high elevation hummingbirds are subject to a totally different um, oxygen percentage in the atmosphere. Now let's take a look at this. This example of the hummingbird is basically found at 9,000 feet. Now, 9,000 feet has a different oxygen, uh, oxygen percentage than it is at sea level. So if we look here at our chart, at sea level, there's roughly, you know, 20.9, let's just say 21% or, yeah, about 21% oxygen at sea level. And then if we get over to 9,000 feet, we can see that that percentage of effective oxygen or available oxygen drops to about 15%. Now, and that, that may not seem significant or hard to grasp, but let's take a look at some other species. Okay, so we have the fiery tailored hummingbird, um, also found in the same range of elevation up to 9,000, which puts us back in the same category. But let's step it up a notch, right? We've got this rainbow, beard, rainbow bearded thornbill, and these guys are found up to at 12,000 feet in elevation. Um, I don't know if you've ever been into the Andes or been up in the high elevation areas here. Um, but it is so, so special. And one of these special birds is the rainbow bearded thornbill. You got the red, the orange, the yellow, the green, the blue, the violet. And if we look at our chart again, we can see that actually the oxygen percentage drops again. It drops from uh, roughly 15% to 13.2%, which is uh, comparable in elevation to Mount Baldy, which is, I think, the largest, the tallest peak in California or in Southern California, excuse me. Um, and then we get into this crazy bird. This is the giant hummingbird. Now, I never thought in my entire life I would see the giant hummingbird. I never thought I'd make it to the Brahma. I never thought I'd make it to the Andes, but lo and behold, I was able to uh, in 2019 when I was volunteering for the Tonda Yapa Bird Lodge um, as a volunteer birding guide. And I got to see these giant hummingbirds. And as you can see, this got some pollen um, on its beak. 
which is a great way to see that this bird was actually visiting uh, natural nectar sources as opposed to just hummingbird feeders. Um, and this bird is a generalist, even though it's one of our highest elevation homers. It's found from sea level to about 14,700 feet. Now, if we look at that, that's only 11.8% of oxygen available. Now, how the heck does a hummingbird do this? I mean, they are under such tremendous stressors because of their flight and their high metabolism and um, their unique diet and things like that. How, how are they able to survive or thrive at 15,000 feet and at sea level? What, what factors are in place that allow these hummingbirds to do that? Well, I'm glad you asked folks. And the reason for that is that there is a special type of hemoglobin with enhanced oxygen binding properties. Now, this isn't a superhero movie, but it might as well be because these birds are fantastic. They have this unique hemoglobin that actually, as opposed to just binding to two oxygen molecules, might bond to 10 or 12 or 15. So for each red blood cell, there's way more oxygen that's bound to it because of the hemoglobin. So that's the way that what that's what allows them to consume a higher um, per gram percentage of oxygen in their muscle tissues because muscles muscle tissues contain a very high uh, count of red blood cells which can, which contain within them hold hemoglobin which gives them that red color and the hemoglobin binds to the oxygen. So long story short, um, it is the hemoglobin with enhanced oxygen binding properties that allow these hummingbirds to persist at these high elevations. It's crazy. Um, now, what's most visually striking about hummingbirds, I think, in my in my opinion, is their feather iridescence. And I'm kind of a sucker for warblers and canagers and colorful colorful birds. Um, and this velvet velvet coronet blew my mind. Um, this is really what the bird looks like. Obviously, I touched the photo up a little bit, but I just had a little bit of fill flash because um, it's pretty challenging shooting in the low light of the cloud forest. But it really gave me an accurate kind of view because without the flash um, or without light hitting the feathers at a certain rate, the whole bird looks basically like black. But when the light hits it just right, like in this photo, you can really see uh, the magnificent iridescence really pop on these birds. How does it work? I knew you guys were gonna ask this. All right, so um, here's a wire crested thorntail. Um, this is another hummingbird species found in the Andes. Um, but at its most simplest level, light is refracting through the microscopic structure of the feather barbules. And just like on the cover of Dark Side of the Moon, you can see that white light, or as it is perceived by us, is actually refracting through a prism. And then each of the different wavelengths of color is being separated so that we can see it, excuse me, with our own eyes. And so what's happening with the hummingbirds is that everything has to do with the viewing angle. So in California, for example, novice birders will often get black chin hummingbirds confused with Anna, Anna hummingbirds. Well, because they look at the bird and they're like, oh man, I see a black chin, must be a black chin hummingbird. But then the hummingbird turns and the gorget lights up that pink fuchsia color and they're like, oh wait. And that's because of the viewing angle and how light refracts like these little, through the feather barbules, which contain these microscopic prism-like structures um, that are uniquely structured to refract back out the specific color that you're seeing, right? So color is essentially inverse in the sense that what we're seeing is the only colors, there's the only wavelength of light that isn't absorbed by the pigments found here. So really fascinating, but long story short, microscopic little prisms in the feather barbules allow light to be refracted so that we can see it. All right, now this presentation uh, dives into my home state of California a little bit um, because we're gonna keep it local for a minute. So in California, we can reliably observe six different species of hummingbirds. And a huge focus of my work is around a holistic approach to ecosystem conservation, right? If you wanna save a species, that's awesome. Um, but to do so, you're gonna need to protect the habitat, including the plants and the other constituents in the environment that uh, it needs to survive. So in a moment, we're gonna talk about native plants, um, but for now, we are going to talk about six species that you can readily see in California. Um, and as you can see, this is the Anna's hummingbird um, with its gorge, gorgeous fuchsia 
or jet that is contained on their head as well. Um, the next up is the Allen's hummingbird. As you can see, it's got kind of this green iridescence on the back, as well as these kind of rusty orange colors, which is a great way to tell the difference between an Allen's and a Rufus hummingbird. Um, the Rufus hummingbird traditionally, or for the most part, um, has an all orange back. Obviously, for folks who are serious birders, um, there's like a 20% of the population of rufous hummingbirds, which are like green backed or whatever. So um, don't hit me with that right now, but long story short, um, this is our third species. And for all, uh, for broad strokes, rufous hummingbirds have um, an all rufous kind of back. And you can see here, this is probably a Northern latitude. This looks like a rosaceae, most likely a salmonberry. Um, we get into number four, this is a calliope hummingbird. And you can see these are actually quite small birds. Um, and you can see that their gorget isn't actually entire and it's kind of got these like beautiful streakings um, happening through here with these iridescent feathers. And for folks who are just learning about hummingbirds or some of their unique terminology, um, the gorget is essentially um, basically terminology used only for hummingbirds and it refers to their iridescent throat patches. Um, and the calliope hummingbird fun fact is actually uh, the North America's smallest hummingbird species, and it's just a little bit bigger than the bee hummingbird, which is found in Cuba and is indeed uh, the world's smallest hummingbird. Um, here's the black chin hummingbird. Now, um, the next species is the costas. Now, if you look closely, um, there's some subtle differences that I want us to key into. First thing is the black chin hummingbird has a black chin. No, I'm just kidding. The black chin hummingbird has. Um, a gorget that isn't really uh, scalloped at all, right? As you compare this to the Costa's hummingbird, um, the gorget kind of scallops around the edges as opposed to being kind of like cut off right here. So you can see it's basically kind of rounded here and it doesn't extend down to the sides um, as opposed to the Costa's hummingbird, which has kind of more of like a horseshoe shape. You can't really see the horseshoe here, um, but it has these kind of uh, side projections of the gorget um, as well as much more purple being able to see, be seen. So we'll review those quickly. Anna's hummingbird, Allen's hummingbird, Rufus hummingbird, Calliope, Blackchin, and then the Costas. Now, how do you track hummingbirds in your backyard? Because anyone who's been paying attention knows that the one of the most, uh, I guess you could, so the biggest idea here is that we can do something about this, right? We are in the middle of this Anthropocene, the sixth large mass extinction. I mean, species are going extinct basically every day, and some of which that we don't even know have gone extinct, so we never even discover them to begin with. Now, if you want to take a stand against this onslaught on our environment, um, there's a lot of things that you can do. Um, but one thing I recommend folks to do locally, wherever they live, is to plant natives. Now, Californians are obsessed with this idea of having uh, lush tropical gardens. Okay, that's cool in the tropics, because if you think about this, if you want to support the wildlife and the birds and the bees and everything that lives where you live, how does planting plants that are not from here support them? Well, it might support them a little bit, but for one example, in California, we have the largest diversity of oak species anywhere in the United States, and I think the world. Now, for example, oaks, um, like the coast live oak, which lives in my neighborhood, these trees host up to 500 species of insects, right? They've been, they found like 500 species in, in an oak tree. Now, if you compare that to a eucalyptus or another, like a ginkgo or whatever, that's like 10 species of insects, like maximum. So if you can imagine that the oak tree is a supermarket of food and resources for birds, which is obviously what we're here about, we want to plant as many oak trees as possible because they are a huge refuge for insects, which create um, amazing opportunities for birds. Now, to raise a pair of nestlings, like a passerine, um, might need to eat like might need to provide like eight thousand caterpillars. So that's a lot of work um, to provide the eight thousand caterpillars. And so, when you have trees that only host five to ten species of insects, in comparison to uh, hundreds of species, species of insects, it should be a no-brainer that planting natives wherever you live is the key to supporting local, indigenous, and native wildlife. I don't care where you live, plant natives, that's the move. Um, all right, so a lot of folks in my area are like, oh, natives? 
You mean desert? I don't think so. California is not a desert. California is one of the most biodiverse places in the world. It was designated as a world biodiversity hotspot in 1996. And there's no shame in plugging our California native plants as a case study for planting natives in general. Now, I created this little, um, created these next couple slides to indicate to folks that if you plant effectively in your garden, um, learning more about your local plants and natural history, um, you can actually have a garden that's flowering a good amount of the time because a lot of folks are like, oh, plants go dormant, this or that, they're not pretty. Well, that's just because you didn't know enough about them. And I'm here to share a little bit of info about some of these awesome plants that grow in my region um, as a case study to catalyze you to learn a little bit more about your native plants and what you can plant in your garden or yard or nearby open spaces and advocating for natives as opposed to exotics. Um, so one, one group of uh, plants that flowers in January and March is currants and gooseberries. These are in the Gracilaraceae family um, and in the genus is Ribe. So here's an Allen's hummingbird on a golden currant. Um, here's another beautiful currant. This is the pink chaparral currant, Ribe malvaceum. Um, and these also provide berries for other bird species later in the year, um, which is really cool. Um, in my region, we have cacti. Um, again, planting regionally appropriate cacti is important. I think there's only like four species of cacti needed to my, to my county. So I encourage folks to plant those from their particular regions. Um, but you can see that these bright colors are very attractive and humans love them and hummingbirds do too. Um, and then we have monkey flowers. These are cool. Oh, whoopsies, dang it. Um, for some reason, people think they look like monkeys or something, or maybe the leaves look like bananas and then whatever. Um, but these are great additions. These are really drought tolerant. These do great in full sun. Um, and they come in a variety of colors. Um, here's the red, the red kind of variety and here's yellow. So you can really add some spice to your garden. Now, as we get into the true summer months in uh, the northern hemisphere, so does or yeah, in the northwest part of the hemisphere, um, June through August is a great time as well to have plants flowering. Um, so we have salvias, which are in the mint family, Lamiaceae. Um, and they're anything but lame, to be honest. These are awesome. As you can see, this is like a condo. It's like a, I don't even know. It's like a vertical market for insects and birds and things like that. And so um, up top, I think we have, I think a Cleveland sage. Um, they're very aromatic, which is indicative of the mint family, Lamiaceae. Um, and they're hugely attractive to hummingbird species. As you can see, they've got these little tubular flowers. Um, and here's another uh, lamid or a salvia. This is the hummingbird pitcher sage. It goes without saying, these birds love them. Um, and if you're planting oak trees, the hummingbird pitcher sage is actually uniquely adapted um, to live in the understory of oak trees in low sunlight. So that's a great way to co-plant under your oaks. Um, um, another example of some beautiful plants that we have are penstemon. So one example is the heartleaf peculia. Um, these are great uh, sun loving and uh, bloom into the early months of summer. Um, and here's another penstemon. Um, this is the showy penstemon, penstemon, I think spectabilis, um, but regardless. And then we have some thistles. So in California, we're kind of impacted by uh, non-native invasive European thistles, um, but we do have at least a couple species of native thistles, including this bull, bull thistle, which is great for hummingbirds in the flowering season, um, and then great for goldfinches and other uh, seed-eating birds during uh, kind of the fall months when these plants put out their seeds. Um, alrighty, now we get into some snapdragons. This is the island bush snapdragon found from the Channel Islands um, and quite lovely. So no space to plant. Okay, no problem. Um, one thing that you can do is you can set up some hummingbird feeders and they're actually really, really fun. Um, so I actually have a couple, most of these feeders actually set up where I live. So maybe folks live in an apartment building. Uh, maybe folks don't have a yard, but they do have a window that they can kind of access. And so this is a pretty ingenious idea. This is like a little suction cup hummingbird feeder. So this part suctions to your wall um, or window or whatever. And this little tray actually lifts up out of this little donut and you can pop it open and refill it with nectar. And then to avoid um, ants, they created this little moat to keep them out from the hummingbird nectar. Um, as you guys can see, these are ruby throated hummingbirds going for the nectar. Now, there's some great, great, great nectar out there. Um, 
I have on the screen, some first nature hummingbird nectar. And you think to yourself, wow, made in the USA. Mm, I cannot wait to get that. Plus premium concentrate. I mean, look at that marketing. Or maybe you're at your local pet food store and you're like, oh, wow, look at this red nectar mix. And it's four hummingbirds. And they always put ruby throated hummingbirds on their, um, on their bottles, which whatever is apparently attractive to the East Coasters. But regardless, it's also made in the USA. Now that is amazing. Or maybe you're at Petco um, and you're like, ooh, hummingbird nectar in a single use plastic water bottle. Perfect. And then you remember this fantastic presentation I gave by Birds by BGS. And then you remember these giant X's over these and you're like, wait, what? You just led me down this rabbit hole and then you crushed my dreams. I didn't crush your dreams. I'm just informing y'all that you should not be using red dye premix um, because you can make your own. And it turns out some of those uh, artificial food colorings are not good for hummingbirds, just like they're really not good for humans. Um, so there is a solution. Yes, there is a solution, okay? I promise. You can make your own solution. Now, I'm about to share my great-great-great-grandmother's secret recipe for hummingbird nectar. And it's a 20% nectar solution. Now, which means it's a one to four sugar to water ratio. Now, at first I was like, wait, is that not 25%? But it is not. It is because there are five total parts. So that means one of the five parts is sugar, and the four other parts is water. And you use warm water to evenly dissolve the sugar. You don't really have to boil the water. Maybe if you live in somewhere where you're, you know, nervous about the water quality or whatever, but warm water should do the trick. Um, shake it up nice and evenly so the sugar dissolves. And then um, most importantly, it's, it's really great to clean your feeders frequently and make sure that the sugar doesn't ferment or turn into alcohol. The birds don't like it. Um, and they will tend to kind of shy away from the feeders if they haven't been changed. So do your birds a favor. Um, good timing for this is maybe three to five days, depending on the temperature of your kind of ambient weather. But um, yeah, and then, oops, yeah. So that's kind of all I've got for you folks. I hopefully that was good because that's all I have planned. Um, that was 53 minutes, so kind of right on schedule. And um, thank you guys all for your time and attention. And I'm going to open it up for questions and feel free to throw them in the chat box and Faraz can like read them off or uh, I don't know how y'all do it generally, but that's kind of usually kind of my style is throw it in the chat and we'll, uh, we'll get to them. Wonderful. Thank you, Benny, for that excellent presentation. Hey, thank you. Um, I'm getting one question already from Leo. Benny, great presentation and very informative. What is the average lifespan of hummingbirds? Mm. Which has the longest lifespan? And what is the greatest threat to hummingbirds? That's a great question. Um, I don't know. I think it really varies by species, right? Like in California, for example, like there's huge birds that can live for, you know, I don't know, what is it, the, like whatever. Birds of different size. I think larger birds live for longer. Um, and I don't know for exact species, but I would probably say between like three to five years is kind of like a rough estimate for hummingbird lifespan. I don't know if for us, if you have any other ideas on that one. Um, I'm just uh, I'm not sure right now. I'm just going to check up, um, just double check and see. But I think three to five years sounds like a, a decent um decent figure yeah um yeah well i just googled it and yes three to five years okay um which has the longest lifespan i don't know that's a really good question i'd have to like google that myself let's see which hummingbird lives it might be the i was thinking of the larger ones the rec record of the longest living hummingbird was held by a broad-tailed hummingbird um, there's a report of one black chin hummingbird at least 10 years, um, buff-bellied hummer for 11 years and two months. So obviously there's a lot of factors that go into that type of stuff, right? I'm sure, I, I don't know if there's hummingbirds in captivity or whatever, but you know, it's really just limited to the data that we have available and how people have been monitoring them. So maybe it's longer than 11 years, but we just don't have the data set that 
is able to kind of provide that evidence. But that's a really good question. I'm, I'm excited to learn more. Um, what is the greatest threat to hummingbirds? Mm. It's a good question. Well, I think in general, right? Like what is the greatest threat to like life on earth? I would say it's probably, <laughs> probably white settler colonialism and extractive economy and placing money over the environment and uh, degrading our environment point past the point of no return. So that's a huge kind of like existential threat. But I would say probably on a day-to-day -day level, what we can do is preserve um, open spaces, we can cultivate native habitats. Um, we can support indigenous communities that are the original stewards of these landscapes. Um, we can keep our cats indoors. Um, we can change our hummingbird feeders. Um, we can continue to remove um, invasive species like cats and things like that. I know Faraz was telling me uh, a while ago about places like Caroni Swamp, which are like, unfortunately, like intermingled with like uh, stray cats and things like that. So. A lot of people don't want to hear this kind of stuff. They want to just like do what they're doing and look at cute pictures or whatever. But if you know me, which you might not, I'm not really only about the cute pictures. And if you know Faraz, he's always got a message um, to tell around conservation. And so we're both very committed to that. And sometimes it sucks to hear, honestly, like the truth, the truth sucks to hear sometimes. But to be a true educator and to be a true champion in the environment, you have to take a stand and you have to speak up for voices that have been silenced for hundreds of years. And, you know, our, you know, our overall planet's health, our individual and collective kind of survival is dependent on the healthy environment. I mean, the entire economy is based on this idea that the environment is fixed, but um, we can see that it is in fact not fixed at all. So it's up to us on an individual level to continue to, to, uh, to advocate for the environment and to, you know, sometimes take more aggressive action than than time permits, right? Like sometimes we feel like, oh, we're gonna just sign this petition or whatever. Like that's definitely a good start, but I have other friends and mentors who, you know, take more guerrilla action into their own hands. So that's up to you to decide what type of action you wanna take. But I encourage folks to take some action, whether it's, you know, planting natives in your yard or being a part of like your local neighborhood council or whatever it is. Um, now, now is the time. Yesterday was the time, so you're a little bit late, but it's never too late, so. You're wonderful. That's a pretty empowering message, man. And I, I would agree with you 100%. I had I had one question for you during the presentation mm -hmm. when when you were showing the video of the really, really close up uh, look at the hummingbird's tongue. Yeah, I was wondering if the, the end of it, the end of the tongue, was it barbed? Yeah, it was like, let's take a look at that, too, because it's pretty crazy. It looks almost like um pelagic like zooplankton that you put on that you get to see yeah. night, like the cilia and like like as it's yeah like, they have the, the kind of um frills antennas yes, exactly. kind of yeah. um let's see it makes sense because all of those like with corals and stuff like that they have all that same kind of um, mechanism and it's meant to trap um nutrients totally let's uh let me share that again Oops, let me go to full screen. Um, yeah, it's somewhere, somewhere right after there. Hold on, sorry, y'all. With high speed macros. All right, we'll just play it out. We see something truly new. With high speed macro photography, we see something truly new. Oh, here we go. With high speed this is what I wanted you guys to see. One more time, yeah. With high speed macro photography, tips that open as the tongue dips into the nectar. Yeah, so like hummingbirds are not something that you would look at and say, yeah, this 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 is an animal with a forked tongue. Let Crazy. alone one that has bars and bobs on it. It's insane. This this adaptation is crazy. I mean, look how like it's insane. Like we would never be able to see any aspect of this feeding if it wasn't set up in a control like this. Yeah. I mean, look at these yeah. little like phalanges extending from the tip of the tongue, and it's already forked. Like they really maximize surface area, and like they can do like whatever. Like 
crazy. I don't even know the stats on how many like sips per second or per minute. That, but that's like, yeah, that's that's what I was also going to get at because it's like this is tremendously magnified and slowed down. Yeah. So um, I have a question from David who wants to know. Uh, what type of trees do hummingbirds typically build their nests in, in the Chicago area? That's a great question. Um, well, hummingbirds are pretty little. So in my experience, um, they probably have similar like branch type preferences. I know I've been like, if you've been following for us on Instagram, he's had some uh, little hummingbird neighbors nesting in his area. And for the most part, what I've observed is hummingbirds, they just prefer thin twigs that they can kind of affix their little cup nest to um because the thicker branches don't really do it so and then on top of that i would imagine that like any smart hummingbird would probably build their nest close to a food source so um that's that's what i would say so i don't have like a specific tree species i think it's more about looking at it on the individual level and seeing like how skinny those branches are and if that's kind of they really like kind of like where they can get tucked in kind of like this little like matrix of small branches nearby that has like a little opening where they can like set their nest up and then kind of get in and out. So I don't think it's uh, related to a specific species of tree uh, exactly, but that is a great question. Yeah, I think it's so it's very, very specific to species because you have different species that like different um, types of nests and they have different vegetation preferences and so on. So yeah, something else that I want, I want to ask you, some people have been wondering, where did I get my incredible Talk Birdie to Me t-shirt? So if anyone wants to know, um, where can where can where can I get some of this incredible Birds by Peaches merch? Where can um, they go? Yeah, it's a good question. So yeah, I produce like I said, if you can go to birdsbybeaches.com. Um, if you're international, I might have to charge you a little extra to ship it to wherever you live. But uh, I do have a sweet little shop section on my website um, with some merch that I design. I'll share that so y'all can see real quick. Yeah, um, good. You can put that, in, put that in. Yeah. I'll throw that in the chat too. But yeah, so like I said, I'm more than just like an educator. It's all about a lifestyle, right? Like you want to... Oh, whoops. It, it's all a, a conversation starter you know like this is this one's, a, this one's a pretty funny one this was like uh so my friends call me Beegis, right i said benjamin isaac jacob schwartz and so um and uh saint francis saint francis the assisi in you know traditional christianity was like kind of woke with the birdies and all the animals came through and i was like well i'm kind of woke with the birdies so i changed it to be just saves and threw some birdies on the back and i kind of like made me a saint francis de assisi as like kind of like a comedic approach to um religion and birding and you know just a conversation piece so as you can see they're kind of wild but here's like a, a more classic kind of toned down one um and really i was just like trying to create the culture that i want to live in i don't want people really talking to me anything about anything other than birds or social justice and equity and things like that so talk birdie to me you know don't waste my time with that other stuff just like let's talk birds like let's let's get into it but uh yeah there's a whole slew of things maybe you're like you know into your fitness and uh you're a female identifying or this feels like your style um there's like a seven color silk screen uh on this poly blend so there's all kind of goodies this is kind of actually what got the, got me started on my birds by beaches um this was my one of my early photoshop images um this is a neotropical bird collage on a all 100 cotton t-shirt um, with my slogan they're not gonna watch themselves so there's uh there's folks there's something for <laughs> the bird lover in everyone's family, or if you're in the California area and you're looking for some uh, guiding situation, um, hit me up. I'm in SoCal, um, leading trips and beyond. But um, not for the shameless plugs, we're here for the birds. Definitely, definitely. Um, okay, so I have another question. Let me see if I, how long does it take the ruby throated hummingbird to migrate the 1000 miles? Mm, that's a good question honestly i don't know what it is it's probably a couple months because these birds um generally hey thanks everybody for the for the love in the chat i can't respond all of, um but i think it's a couple months really um timeline yeah i'm sorry about that i have a, a strange creaky door behind me that keeps moving uh let's see i have another question uh any comment about tourism and humming, hummingbird interface 
a lot of uh, ecotourism and native tourism business use hummingbirds as a product. Mm -hmm. Any guidelines, protocols to use to conserve the hummingbird and balance impacts? That's a good question. I'm going to pass it to Faraz since he's kind of lives in the tropics and uh, definitely I've been to some amazing lodges with him in particular um, that use hummingbirds. So I don't know, in your experience, Faraz, what do you think some, some best practices that, that lodges that you take folks to or kind of hummingbird gardens that you bring folks to? Because you're, you're absolutely right. Um, Jaladin, Jalaluddin. Yes, Jalaluddin, yeah. Jalaluddin, um, Jalaluddin is also from Trinidad and Tobago. So um, yeah, definitely. So what I would say is um, there are certain guidelines that we should adhere to in terms of um, how we do things, right? Um, for example, what what is the feed? If you have artificial feeders out, what is the feeder density? So are they going to be like, um, you know, ten feeders in a in a ten in a ten by ten um, square foot space? You know, like that. It might be a little bit too um, too dense in terms of uh, in terms of hummingbird activity and that kind of thing. So I would say like, you know, a, a common sense approach, but also an informed approach to see, well, what is, what is good for, in terms of the welfare of the birds? But um, Jaladin, that's something that you and I can, can chat on um, at length <laughs> at some point. So I'm just going to check on Gail. Okay. Yeah, I saw an email address uh, for this presentation and that it was talk booty 101 and i really thought that was like one of your alter egos or something like that <laughs> Benny. but turns out it's not oh that's awesome i, I wish that was my email <laughs> <laughs> oh man okay cool so i think i think i've covered all the questions um yeah a lot of a lot of praises for you from various various uh, locations Right, uh, we have Kusum here from Sri Lanka. There are no hummingbirds in Sri Lanka, but, but you got uh, some, but you got some birds out there, so that's cool. Yeah, too. some incredible birds, right? Um, let's yeah, see. huge, huge thanks to everyone for coming out. You know, support, learn the birds. They're doing some awesome work, uh, bridging the conversation between uh, birders and conservation and education and photography. I mean, who doesn't want to submit photos to get critiqued by a dude or something? So that's, <laughs> that's an awesome opportunity and amazing uh, international effort to collaborate. Cause I think that's the biggest thing, right? We get so pigeonholed into our local areas. Um, Definitely. But we, we fail to see kind of the broad scale impacts. And that's why I went broad and talked about hummingbird migration and showing that, you know, for the Rufus hummingbird in that presentation, the only way it was able to get across those 4,000 miles is because there's intact habitat along the way that allows birds to rest, recover, and refuel for their journey. So if we aren't stretching our hands across the globe and working with organizations and lever leveraging our privilege from first world or wherever the hell we live um, to places that, you know, maybe don't have the same type of resources we have at our disposal, like, I don't know, what are we doing with all that money? We can't take it with us when we die or whatever. So let's use it to... Uh, uplift this planet and trying to create more environmental equity and uh, create platforms for folks to create sustainable opportunities for whether it's tourism or beyond. So it's up to us, everybody. Great. Wonderful. And I hope that the world hears a lot more from you in the coming years for sure. <laughs> I hope so. hope so. A lot of good things, to, a lot of really positive things to contribute. So again, everyone, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Benny, for this wonderful presentation. Okay, thank you. And um, good. So with that, we'll call it a night and take care, everyone. And until we meet again. Bye-bye. Cheers, everybody. <laughs>